invite um, Alex and Jerry to come up and bring the microphone with you guys. And I'm going to invite everyone to stand as we read from God's Word today. Hear the Word of God from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, he, he asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this the brother of James, Joseph, J Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to him, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay the hands of a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. Those were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except for a staff. No bag, no bread, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra pair of shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons, anointed many sick people with oil, and healed them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. True or false, God is love. True. True. God has a plan for your life. Jesus is a healer. True. He died for your sins, and he rose again on the third day. Amen. Yeah. Uh, he wants to save you. He wants to restore you. And he wants to take you to heaven. All true, all true. That's the gospel. But there's also other parts of the gospel we don't talk about as much, but they are something that Jesus talked a lot about and even promised to us, and that is you will be rejected and you will be persecuted for following Jesus. And there's uh, uh, the same treatment that Jesus received, those that follow Jesus can also be expected to receive. And we're getting into a section of Mark that's about the rejection of Jesus. And so we're going to talk today about something that doesn't seem like such good news, it's, but it's part of the good news. Um, and that is uh, the rejection that Jesus faced and his followers will face. Now, I don't think it's a good look for Christians to go around thinking they're so persecuted, okay? You know, we got it really good in the country that we live in. And uh, so I, I don't want to, it's not a good look for us to say, oh, I'm so persecuted. Sometimes we can be rejected not because of Jesus, but because uh, we're a jerk or uh, we're offensive in some other way. And so every time that a Christian is rejected, we don't need to hang that on Jesus and say, oh, I'm, I'm being rejected because of Jesus. Sometimes it's just, it's just, uh, your breast stinks, all right? So it, sometimes it's just that. But, uh, but uh, it is true that if you go for Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you, you can expect mixed results the same way that Jesus uh, experienced mixed results. And so part of this section in, in Mark, you know, Mark, if he was a movie producer, he would keep the camera, or director, he would keep the camera on Jesus almost constantly, but he only leaves it a time or two. And one is to tell the story of the death of John the Baptist. That's part of this chapter we didn't get a chance to read. You know, John was a forerunner to Jesus, and uh, it was a uh, you know, people were coming to him and hearing God's word. People were responding. But he got crossways with Herod. Herod. This is Herod Antipas, who's the son of Herod the Great that was around when Jesus was born. This is his son. And he didn't have the full kingdom of his father. He just had a, a tetrarchy. Uh, he was uh, a fourth of his dad's kingdom. And, and uh, that would happen to be where Galilee was, where Jesus and John the Baptist both uh, did their, centered their ministry. And uh, speaking truth to power, John the Baptist told uh, Herod that he was not to have Herodias as his wife because she was the, the wife of his brother Philip. And uh, Herod didn't like this, put him into prison, but Herodias 
wanted him dead for this. But, you know, Herod, and if you read, if you read the Gospels, Herod, Antipas, and, and John the Baptist had this kind of unique relationship. He was entertained and also afraid of John the Baptist. He, he believed he was from God, but he couldn't really own that fully because then he would have to repent himself. So, uh, so he kind of kept him in prison and brought him out and from time to time. But he had a big birthday bash for him and his high muckety-mucks, and they were celebrating, and they were drinking, and they were having a good time. And, um, and Herodias' daughter, who history identifies as Salome, came out in front of these men and danced for them and uh, made such a good impression on Herod that he was bragging on her. This is like his... This is really creepy. This is like his stepdaughter slash niece, you know. This is, just kind of imagine this scene. Or maybe don't imagine this scene. But, but, uh, but he, he's bragging in front of his friends. He said, hey, I'll give you, that was so great. I'll give you anything you want as a gift, up to half my kingdom. And she went over and whispered in her mother's ear, and her mother whispered in her ear, and she came back and said, I would like the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so he's made this promise now in front of his friends, and he cho chooses pride over what's right, and he sends men down into the dungeon and take the head of John the Baptist and presents it as this gruesome birthday gift, if, if you will. And so this is part of the, the foreshadowing that Mark gives us of the cross of Jesus. The shadow of the cross falls across these early chapters, and, and he's building the tension here that Jesus is facing with, in different places. And he, and he takes this section and he shows us that Jesus is not going to be universally acclaimed. He's not going to be universally accepted. And, and he, he draws the stark contrast by bringing us to Jesus' hometown. Now, we're not talking about Bethlehem here, where Jesus was born. We're talking about Nazareth, Nazareth, where Jesus was raised. Now, I was born in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, but I never lived in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. That's where the hospital was, okay? So it's kind of like Jesus, you know. He, would, he didn't spend much time in Bethlehem. He was there as a baby. He was, it was his birthplace, but it wasn't the place where he was raised. He was raised in this town called Nazareth. And Nazareth is about 25 miles southwest of this area of Capernaum where, you know, he's been ministering. And, and it's, it's a town, they've excavated this out. In fact, some of us are going to Israel in a couple months, and we're going to go to Nazareth. And it's a town kind of built into a hillside, so a lot of the houses, maybe you go into your house and it's got a structure to it, but it's almost like a cave. It's a dugout kind of place, and the, the, the place identified as the, birth, as the childhood home of Jesus where there's a church built on top of it, you go below the altar and you're going into almost like a cave-like thing where people kind of live. It's about 60 acres, Nazareth, the population about 500, okay? And there's a lot of towns in Israel that have a provenance of, boy, famous things happened here. There was a famous battle. There was a famous person from here. Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament at all. There's nothing significant about Nazareth except that's where Jesus grew up. In fact, you might remember that in John chapter 1, Nathaniel said, you know, told, come, Andrew says, come meet this, the Messiah from Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's, it's kind of a, a nothing town. And uh, so, you know, Jesus is there in the synagogue. I assume this is the synagogue where he was raised and set as a boy. And he's teaching and he's preaching. And as Mark tells us, he was teaching with authority. And they're immediately offended at him. Where did he get these things? You know, he's not been to seminary. You know, a, a good rabbi, maybe when they were 12 years old, they would have been sent off to Jerusalem down south. They would have studied with the top rabbis of the day. They would have learned rabbinic law and the interpretation of the law. And they would have, they would have had all the trappings of greatness. They said, this, this Jesus, we know him. He's, he's the carpenter. Now, that, that word carpenter is, uh, in the Greek, is tekton. And it shows up in our word architect. Architect means master builder. And tecton just means builder. Um, and back then, you know, a lot of times we think of carpenter, we think of swinging a hammer and hitting nails. But they didn't build with wood as much back then. They built mostly with stone. And so if you think about a tecton, they are a builder. And their main building uh, material was, was uh, we might call them a stone worker, uh, probably more than a more than a woodworker. And, uh, you know, 
you know, sometimes Jesus is called the son of a carpenter, but here he's called a, a carpenter. You know, Herod Antipas built a new uh, palace and capital for himself in uh, four miles from Nazareth. In, uh, uh, he named it after the emperor Tiberius. And that was going to be his new capital over this tetrarchy. And, uh, and secular history tells us that he called in all the tectons from the surrounding area to come work on his big building project. And this is exactly the time when Jesus and, and maybe Joseph would have been tectons. And so he might, you know, he was like, a, a, he, they knew him as the, the carpenter, as the builder, as the tecton. And then they said, isn't he Mary's son? Now, there's a couple layers to this. You know, you know the normal designation would be son of the father. You know, you, the, you know I am Jesus, son of Joseph, as the, he was thought of. He would, they'd always name the father's name. Here they, they, they use Mary's name. And what to make of this? Well, um, Joseph seems to have died sometime between the time when Jesus was 12 years old and 30 years old. We have the last look at Joseph when Jesus was 12 and lost in Jerusalem, if you remember that story in Luke's gospel. And he seems not to have been in the picture later in Jesus' life. And so maybe they say Mary's son because Joseph uh, wasn't in the, the picture, but they probably still would have known him as the son of Joseph. So maybe Mary's a little bit of a slam mentioning his mother because you know, there may have been some rumors floating around. Wasn't she uh, pregnant before she got married? Wasn't this kind of a, a hurry-up wedding kind of thing? What's really the story there? This is the son of, this is the son of Mary, and his, his brothers are with us, his sisters. They, they list the brothers uh, there in, the, in the, the story. And the Bible says they're offended at Jesus. I said, where, where did he learn to do miracles? Where's all this stuff? Well, they were offended at his reputation because they know him. And Jesus, in response, is going to say, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. There is a contempt that comes with familiarity. And Jesus kind of warned against this, that a prophet would often be rejected by those closest to him. Sometimes we don't accept what God is doing and the gifts that God is giving us because it's not wrapped in the kind of wrapping that we expect to see. I think we miss a lot of blessings in life because God sends us stuff that's not wrapped like we expect it to be wrapped. It doesn't look like we... And it may come from somebody that we don't even think much of. God may have a blessing uh, for us. Uh, you know, this happens to me all the time. I, I had a, um, a friend reach out to me from Wisconsin, and he's, their church is going through the same denominational process we're going through, in a bigger church. And he said, I, I, I need an expert to come talk to us about this. And he reminded me, an expert is somebody that's over 20 miles away and has a briefcase and says, Chris, you have, you're over 20 miles away, and do you have a briefcase? Because we'd like you to come and, and be our expert. And you got to take that word expert apart. Ex is has been, and spurt is a little drip under a lot of pressure. Okay, so you don't want to you don't want to be a don't want to be a, an expert uh, uh, always. I, uh, I got a call from uh, somebody in Alaska. I never talked to people in Alaska, but a guy from Alaska called me this week, and and, and we had prayed together and talked together about what God was doing in his life, and he said, "I'm studying." Uh, your sermons on YouTube from the Gospel of Luke, and I'm working through that, and God's showing me things through that. And I was like, that's great. It's like, why don't you Geneseo people? Why don't you study my old sermons from, from the Gospel of Luke? What's wrong with you all? You know, I'm, come on. <laughs> You're like, well, that's Pastor Chris. He wears Crocs in the pulpit half the time. So, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, come on. It's, we, we know this guy. We can hear him. We can hear him anytime. But my favorite story recently was uh, my friend Ben, who Ben and I pastored in the same town. He was at the Bridge Free Methodist Church, and I was at New Bethel United Methodist Church. And we would go eat Chinese food together, just kind of about the same age, and both serving churches, and we just kind of enjoyed each other's company. And I moved on, he moved on. He's now a district superintendent in the Free Methodist denomination. And uh, I... Uh, 
uh, uh, he, he was traveled recently to England, and they had a big trip there, several of them, to visit the Free Methodists there and uh, to visit the John Wesley sites. Just kind of Methodists kind of had this pilgrimage thing. We go into England and seeing where John Wesley did his stuff. They were doing all that. And he went to Kingswood School, and the, the headmaster of Kingswood greeted them, and, and he says, as a, as a gift, this is a gift we give to all our visitors, there's a book that mentions Kingswood School, and I'm going to give you an autographed copy of seven things John Wesley expected us to do from kids, from autographed by Reverend Dr. Christopher Ritter. And it's like, that's the guy I ate Chinese. <laughs> so he had to go to England to learn what a big deal I am. And now he wants me to come talk to his pastors about the, about the book and everything. But, you, you know, they're just, just, you know, when some, we live with somebody, we just don't look at them in, this, in the same way. But God sometimes comes to us to the very ordinary and familiar. And Jesus was somebody they knew. They saw him go to work with his lunch pail for years. And now God's doing things in him and through him. And they rejected Jesus. Uh, and Jesus could do no great miracles. You know, see, you know, Mark is really about all that Jesus can do. Can do, can do. Can stop the storm. Can uh, cast out the demons. Can, can, can. This, is, this sticks out in Mark's gospel. Jesus can't. Why can't, you know, isn't Jesus sovereign? Can he do whatever he wants to do? Well, it may be that he couldn't heal because not too many people came to him for healing. Because they thought they understood him. They thought they knew him. And maybe it was the atmosphere of faith. You know, God works through faith. And if somebody does not put their faith out there, that they, they, you know, without faith it's impossible to please God. Those without faith, James tells us, should not expect to receive anything from God. And so Jesus even experiences this limitation. It's really the first time in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus can't do something. But Jesus is going to send his disciples out. It's the very next movement here. And he's going to send them out uh, as, as Jerry read for us, two by two, uh, six teams. You know, it's important that they go on this journey and release them. You know, a good way to mentor people is I do it, and then we do it, and then you do it, right? That's how mentoring works. I do it, we do it, you do it. And, and so Jesus is releasing them to, to do the stuff, to preach repentance, to cast out demons, and to heal the sick, and to do the Jesus stuff. Uh, he sends them out, and eventually he's going to send them out into all the world. At the end of uh, the Gospels, we have the, always the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation, Mark tells us. So they're going to have this global mission, but, but Jesus is going to send them out on this limited mission to teach them some lessons of faithfulness and to teach them in part how to handle rejection, because they're going to face some. You know, he gives them some special instructions. Anybody here, when you're getting ready to take a trip, anybody a real good packer? Would you just admit to that? You're just, or maybe you're, okay, Janet's a good packer. Janie's a good packer. My wife, back there in the back, Becky is an exceptional packer. When you open up her suitcase, it looks like Marie Kondo. Put all that stuff in there, and it's all rolled up, and not, it just she does a real thorough job of it. Uh, I'm the kind of guy, five minutes before it's time to go, anybody like this? I better get the suitcase out of the basement, and I just start chucking stuff, chucking stuff in, you know, and it always happens, we get to where we're going, I've forgotten stuff, I've got way too much of other stuff, because uh, one thing Becky and I have in common, we both overpack probably, you know. Jesus uh, is, you know, we're a little worried about this Israel trip, because we've got these weight allowances, you can only have so much luggage to go on this international trip. Jesus gives them a weight uh, limit of zero. Okay, it's not 50 pounds like United Airlines or whatever. This is, uh, this is zero. You're, gonna, you're, you're not going to take an extra shirt. You can have your sandals. You can have your shirt on. You can have a walking stick. But you cannot take any money. I do not recommend you travel this way, okay? But the, Jesus told me you're not to take any money in your, in your belt. Uh, no extra, don't take food, don't take money, just, just go. Why does Jesus give them these strange instructions? Well, he's going to show them that he can provide for them. And this is something they're going to need to know for their global mission as well. 
that God's going to provide wherever they go. But I want you to go to town, town to town. And when somebody receives you, you stay with them. You know, an extra shirt would have been basically your blanket to, if you had to sleep on the ground. And Jesus is basically telling them, you're not going to sleep on the ground. Somebody's going to take you in. And, uh, and when, you, when somebody takes you in, you stay with that person for the whole time you're there. Now, it wouldn't be uncommon you go and maybe a poor person invites you to stay with them. And then you're there a couple days and then maybe a wealthier person says, oh, I didn't know you guys were in town. You can come stay at my villa. You know, we've got extra rooms and I've got a man cave there and got a lot of food. Jesus says, don't upgrade. Don't, don't, don't ditch the first family that welcomed you to go to the wealthier family or the people. Don't work your way up. You be satisfied with what I give you. You stay humble. You, you, you're not there to, to uh, aggrandize yourself in any way or to be honored. You're there to represent the, the kingdom of God. And you just go. And he prepares them for rejection. It says, when they reject you, wipe the dust off your feet and, and move on. He does not promise they will be received. He just, he just calls them to go. And he's going to provide. God's work done, done God's way will never lack God's supply. You hear that? God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. God's going to provide for them, but they're going to be rejected. Jesus said a, master, a servant is not greater than his master. If this is how they treated me, they're going to treat you the, the, same, the same way. But he tells them to go anyway. They're going to be rejected. Go anyway. And that's a good lesson for us because we're sent to go. You know, the gospel has two big words to it. One is come, and we gather, we come to Jesus. But then the other part of the gospel is go. My friend Fred Bishop likes to say two-thirds of God is go. And there's some of Jesus that you get when you gather, when you come. There's some of Jesus you get when you go. He meets us out there, and we, we understand more about Jesus as we as we go, even when we experience rejection. You know, somebody told me that it takes 21 encounters with the gospel for somebody to say yes to Jesus. That means you need 20 failures before you get to a success. Right? Because so sometimes we speak, they may not be ready now, but you're planting a seed for later. So we got to be able to handle rejection. I, I was a salesman for one point in my life, in my early 20s, and it was straight commission, and I was kind of an introvert, and, you know, I didn't like rejection, and my sales manager at the time said, you better get, you better get comfortable with rejection, because you got to get 20 no's for every yes, so you better work through some no's here, buddy, if you want to eat tonight, cause if you want to get to that yes, so you got to be willing to accept some, uh, accept some rejection, because not everybody is going to receive, and some will be hostile, but some will later change their mind, as Saul did who became the Apostle Paul. So we've got to be faithful. I love a line from Mother Teresa because somebody was asking her about the success of her movement and if she was going to be able to do this and that. And she said very simply, God's not called me to success. God's called me to faithfulness. God has not called you to success. He's called you to faithfulness. You're not responsible for the results. You're responsible for being a witness. For Jesus, even if it means people look at you cross-eyed, even if, whatever, even if they don't want to hear it, you don't have to be obnoxious, you can be winsome, you can smile when you do this, okay? But you need to be ready to be a witness for Jesus even when you don't quite even feel like it. And rejection is promised. But a greater promise is also given. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's prepare to come to the table of the Lord. We commune with Jesus as we're sent for Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us for missing some gifts because they didn't come wrapped like what we thought they should look like. Forgive us for being timid about going for you because we can't handle rejection. To be accepted by you is to be rejected by men. And we thank you that you're with us on the mission. 
you will provide, you will guide, you will bless, even in the midst of it all. We thank you, Jesus, that on the night you gave yourself up for us, you took bread, you broke the bread, you gave it to your disciples and said, take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, likewise, took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to your disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice. Thank you that yours is the glory, yours is the mission, yours is the power, yours is the provision. Make us one as you pour your Holy Spirit out, out upon these gifts make, and your people. Make us one with you. Make us one with each other. Make us one in mission. Make us one in ministry. Rejected, accepted, it doesn't matter, Lord, as long as we're accepted by you. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.